All right, welcome to Bible Study Hub. My name is Noelle, and this is my lovely co-leader and mother, Anne. We're going to dive into Daniel chapter 2, finish that up, and then get into Daniel chapter 3, a favorite story of the fiery furnace. Before we do that, let's get ourselves a running start into Daniel chapter 2. Mom, give us the background so that we can get going. Really, really quickly, Daniel is in exile. And last week we read about how King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, either couldn't remember it or didn't want to tell his wise men, but for whatever reason, he told the wise men, you're not just going to interpret the dream for me. You're going to tell me what it was. They all freaked out, couldn't do it. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's plan was to dismember them, chop, chop as punishment. So that sounds like a good time. And Daniel hops in and is like, what's going on guys? As he's being rounded up and they tell him and Daniel's like, I can do it. I can, I can do the dream. So ends up that Daniel does tell the dream to the king and then he interprets it. So last week we went through the, the statue, the head of gold was Nebuchadnezzar. And then we said that the next part was the, the silver arms and chest and that the Bible tells us a little bit later in a couple of chapters, there it is, is the Medo-Persian empire. They were the next in line. Then we have Greece, which is the bronze sort of midsection there into the thighs. And then we kind of stopped on the legs of iron. And we just said, well, the Bible tells us what the other empires were. It does not tell us what the legs of iron were. Some of you at the end of our discussion said, I still think it's the Roman empire. And some of you said, I'm kind of convinced now that it might be the Islamic caliphate. We ended up by just saying, hey, we don't really know for sure. And either one is a valid option. We just kind of like to know what the options are. So tonight we're going to pick up actually where we get to the feet in Daniel 2, 41 to 43. And we're going to talk about what those feet might be. So Noel, why don't you read 41 to 43? Yeah, absolutely. The reason all of this matters is because this is actually apocalyptic prophecy. So generally in yes. the Bible, you think of the book of Revelation when you think like end times, apocalyptic prophecy, that's what this is too. Daniel, like he had a corner on the market. He was ahead of the time. So this is Daniel chapter two, 41 through 43. Um, and as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong, partly brittle. Um, as you saw, the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And we can think about this in terms of, you know, we're talking about this, uh, the legs would be this, this uh, kingdom that's going to come, this rule that's going to come on earth in the end times, um, that's going to just be horrible and crushing and autocratic and awful. And it's sitting on top of these feet that are iron mixed with clay. And obviously iron and clay don't actually mix together. So it's going to be parts of iron, like bits of iron with bits of clay. Um, and this is an, this is an odd one. We can ask what, what does the iron represent? What does the clay represent? Um, and I highly recommend you doing more study on that, but really what it comes down to is that whatever this is, it's going to be it's going to be something that's not um, super sturdy. There's going to be an element of it that's very, very strong and then an element of it that is significantly less so. Let me just read to you um, the next verse going into 44. It says, in those days, um, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms. So this kingdom God sets up is going to break apart all these other kingdoms we're talking about and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. This is a fascinating dream that Daniel comes in and represents beautifully. He wasn't told what the dream was to begin with, so now he's told what the dream is. Not only that, but he said, hey, this is what the dream means. And what I love about it, again, this is apocalyptic prophecy. This is end times prophecy. What you always see in that is at the end, God prevails, God triumphs, God wins. And so you see this, um, this stone that is cut out, not by human hands, that just shatters. Every and who is that, kingdom. Noel? How that do we know Jesus? what that rock is? <laughs> that would be Jesus. 
Um, yeah, Daniel ends this super conclusively and just says this interpretation is sure. And so that we come in and we're like, oh, you know, the rock, it's God, it's Jesus, it's all of this. But we're not just pulling that out of anywhere. Where do we get that from, Mom? Well, it's, he's already talked about it. And we know from other studies of the end times that when Jesus comes back, he does come back and take out the kingdoms that are opposing him. So that is exactly what's happening here. And when it when it strikes that current at that time, world power that is iron and clay mixed together. And again, we don't know exactly what that looks like. We'll know more as time goes on, I am, I'm assuming. Uh, but whatever yeah. that conglomeration is there, he when he strikes that, it takes the whole statue down. Something that we said last week over and over, it's it's one statue that's key right. to the interpretation. It's not five separate statues. So when he strikes that one, the whole thing crumbles and it turns into like the the dust of the air. Like it's it's completely, totally, and utterly gone. Jesus triumphs yeah. over Yay! everything. So if you ever get to feeling kind of down about the way the world is going, I always myself, I just think ahead. I'm like, Jesus has got this thing in the end so tied up. It is so airtight. He's going to take care it. of all of it. So that's what happens there. I love that. But we also see how God, even in the short term for these guys, took care of them. Um, yeah. Verse 46 through 47, Nebuchadnezzar, is so grateful that Daniel's done this. I like what he says. He says, truly, your God is God of gods. That reads so rough, isn't it? And Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. We remember these are polytheists, so they have lots and lots of gods. They're very comfortable with lots and lots of gods. So it's basically what he's saying is that your God is the God of all the other little G gods. He is in no way, to be clear, mm -hmm. you know, denouncing all of his other gods, but he's going to He has not seen and... the light yet. <laughs> he has not, no. No. And then he gives these honors and he he takes care of them. I also love here how Daniel makes a request of the king to take care of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Of interest, this is where we start using their um, their Babylonian names. You're going to see this a lot. Um mm -hmm. And so he, he takes care of his friends and then they remain at the king's court. So this situation that was supposed to end in everybody being, you know, brutally murdered, frankly, it was, it was not mm -hmm. going to be a good time. Um, this actually ends in huge honors upon Daniel and his friends and God taking care of them. God not only saving them, but because they were able to produce all the other wise men and astrologers and mystics that were supposed to be murdered because they couldn't pull it together. They were all saved as well, which I absolutely love. So now and we get into Daniel chapter three, which be, is an before interesting we, back. Go ahead. Before we, before we do that really quickly, I just wanted to highlight something about this whole, this last little section of chapter two here. And that is that Daniel and his friends have such a close knit relationship and you can see why. And, and then there's a point to this for our own lives here because they were so foreign to this horrible place that they had been taken hostage to. And the other Jewish men that had been taken with them, these young, young men, young teenagers, none of them apparently followed after the Lord like Daniel and then Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego did. So you can see that they are, they're watching out for each other. They're taking care of each other. As Daniel is promoted, he says to the king, hey, don't forget my friends, these guys. And the king's like, hey, any friend of yours is a friend of mine. And so they also raise them. But I think it just, it reminds us of why we need each other as believers and why it's so important not to try to live the Christian life so as, a, as a loner, because you just, you need the encouragement, you need the help. And we, we help each other. That's what we do as followers of Christ. And it's what they did as followers of the living God. Oh, it's so good. That's so good. We need each other. And Bible Study Hub Facebook group has so been that too. Yes. So I'm so grateful we have that. For all of us. Yeah. When we go into Daniel chapter three, the story that we're about to get into, for many of you might be familiar, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And if you've heard this before, uh, you kind of have a sense of what's coming and what we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm really excited for what we're about to talk about because I feel like for myself, I may have um, so zoned in on a particular aspect of this in the past that I sort of missed the broader teaching. So we're going to talk about that. If you're not familiar with this story, though, and I think many of you aren't, this is wild. What's about to happen, like, buckle up. It gets really wild. This is a huge chunk of text, but I'm actually going to read through this because it's going to help you understand where we're coming from. 
when we're in the Bible and it goes from chapter two to chapter three, we just remember that it wasn't originally written that way. Daniel just wrote in, you know, prose. He didn't have chapters. We've done this so we can organize it. But this is, you know, this is directly after what we just read. So Daniel gives this, this vision. This is the statue. This is what it means. This is who you are, Nebuchadnezzar. And this is what happens next, which is just classic. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits, its breadth six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, all the officials of the provinces to come up to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justice, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. The herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So we go from, in the last chapter, you know, this particular statue that is in the dream. Now we've got another statue. This one's a little different. Mom, talk about what this statue is. What's going on here? You know, I I just imagined in my own mind that the King Nebuchadnezzar, he's thinking through that whole dream that Daniel just interpreted. He's like, I'm the head of gold. I'm the head of gold. I have an idea. Oh boy. He gets all happy with himself. The whole thing gold and it will be me. Um, What's interesting about this statue, we're not normally measuring things in cubits around here. Um, Cubit they think was about 18 inches ish. So if you kind of do the math, the statue is about 90 feet high and about nine feet wide or across. So think of more of the shape of the Washington Monument. We're talking really tall and skinny. Kind of narrow. Yeah, was the whole thing, was it like tall and skinny and he had a statue on the top of it or was the whole thing him? That would have been hard to keep from toppling over. Uh, We don't really know, but however it was, he overlaid the entire thing with gold, was quite, quite happy with himself about it and just decided that he's going to now be worshiped. And this is why we just highlighted in chapter two, by the way, that when when he said, oh, you're Daniel, your God is God capital G of God's lower G and and the the Lord of Kings, I think is how he said it. Yeah. He wasn't there. He just meant you're the top dog in all the gods, you know, you, your God wins. Yeah. He's not there yet. And you can see that because now he's, he's uh, going to worship himself. Um, What I think is interesting, Noel, and I I don't know if you want to weigh on in on this or not, but there's like this huge list of eight different types of rulers or groups of rulers and and the bible has such an economy of words and yet it lists all eight out in a list and then the very next verse i think it's verse three all eight again right on the heels of it that's very unusual for the bible to do what what do you think yeah it is we talk about an economy of words in the bible and the text generally is very pointed it's very simple it's intended to be very, very simple, right? We don't want it to be something that's, you know, super prose, very, very long. And so when you see a lot of repetition happening, again, it's it was very hard for these guys to write. Paper was hard, ink was hard, all of it's hard. So when we see them doing that and repeating, generally that indicates there's some point that he's really trying to drive home for us. In this case, I think really what would, Daniel's trying to show is when he repeats twice these many groups of people, um, he's just showing the the breadth of this. This applies to absolutely everyone. And then he goes through the list of instruments twice as well. And again, just Mm -hmm. highlighting this is so prolific. This is everywhere. This is everything. This is constant. You can't get away from this. This is just this is going to happen. Everybody's involved in this. This is an issue that everybody has. And I think that's 
that's really an intriguing that's an intriguing way of using the text. If we move on to verses 8 through 12, we see that this is actually leveraged by the Chaldeans. And I like the phrasing here. It says, therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. This is, this is so interesting. Their intent is not like, hey, we just really love our king. We just want to make sure that everyone's obeying his idolatry and all this it's like no there's there's maliciousness they declared to king nebuchadnezzar O king live forever you O king have made a decree we get the re repetition again that every man who hears the sound of the horn pipe lyre trigon harp bagpipe every kind of music shall fall down worship the golden image and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning fiery furnace it's like we know there are certain jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of babylon Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. A few notes of interest here, because I just, this is fascinating. Certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon. So he, they're actually not accusing all of the Jewish men. And I think there's two components to this. One being probably the majority of the, um, exiles who were here actually complied with this and actually bowed down as so there was nothing to there's nothing to call out but when it says they maliciously accused the jews and then you know these certain jews who you have appointed over the affairs there is such a clear thread of jealousy mm -hmm. and um hatred for these men and i think it's because god was just blessing them like crazy the fact that they were appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon. We're not so specific on what that means, except that this is not going to be the position that some low level person holds. I mean, these gentlemen were given some amount of authority and power. And it's clearly, I mean, these Chaldeans who come forward, a couple of them who come forward maliciously, they're just peeved about it. And they're mm -hmm. just mad that this is the situation that they're in. So I think it's, yeah, I think it's interesting that that's where we're in. Again, they repeat a lot of repetition here. Whoever does not fall down in worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Um, Mom, you shared with me a little bit about like what this looked like. Um, I, I we're gonna get into it in a moment, but this isn't this isn't some small deal, right? This is a huge. This yeah. is a huge kind of frightening image for these gentlemen. Oh, oh, it's absolutely terrifying. It's like Nebuchadnezzar laid awake at night if he wasn't having dreams and, and thought of like, how are the worst ways I could possibly execute people? And then came up with whatever he could think of. It was just horrendous. Um, so if you've ever been a, a child in Sunday school and you know, if you have been, you have to have done Daniel uh, with these, these three in the fiery furnace because that's just, like a rite of passage if you're a little child in Sunday school. And they always have those pictures of like, of like this little platform with some flames coming up. And then you have the three men that you can see, you know, and that kind of gets in, a, in our mind. This was absolutely, well, an inferno. I, I can't think of another yeah, way to an describe inferno. it. They, they actually had these huge, huge, huge kilns. Um, Nebuchadnezzar was a prolific builder, like one of the best in the ancient world. He built so many amazing things. So they had to use like um, mud bricks to do this. So in order to fire the mud bricks, they would have these monstrosities of kilns. So we used to wonder, like, did they just throw them into one of those kilns? But they were doing some excavating a while ago. Actually, they came across so cool. uh, a plaque that basically said this is where I, i'm paraphrasing here but this is where we threw people that didn't worship the gods of the chaldeans into the inferno so we yeah, don't know if that was like the inferno or if they just did this on a regular basis but it seems like you know again archaeology is kind of like yep shores up what the bible already said <laughs> it yeah. always does that but you know what noel i want to ask the group a question here we want to get you involved good in some questions question. for you oh, uh, i don't one. know about about all of you but yeah as soon as I read this, the burning question in my mind is, why is Daniel not mentioned? Where is he? Um, what happened with him? So go ahead and start commenting, whether you're on YouTube live right now with us, we can see your comments, or you're on Facebook right now live, we can also see your comments. Tell us what you think. I mean, last week we talked all about Daniel and his faith and his 
obedience. In fact, the week before even um, with not wanting to eat the king's food because he would have disobeyed. So it it just seems odd. It seems really, it really odd that he's <laughs> nowhere to be found in this story. So we are anxious to see what you have to say about this. Yeah. And by Obviously, the way, this is always a question that asks. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, this is a question that is permanently on my intriguing questions list on my phone. So it made the list. Like that's, that's how interesting this that's is. Good. Obviously he's the narrator of this. He's the one who wrote it. So presumably if he were there, he would have included himself. We see him include himself in everything else. He's not trying to keep himself mm -hmm. out of the story. So it's pretty obvious he wasn't. Um, Alan says possibly on official business elsewhere. Some have even suggested Daniel was exempt due to what he just produced due to okay. his interpretation of the dream in the last passage. The one I haven't heard is possibly on official business elsewhere. It's so like we just <laughs> said, these they have really risen up in the ranks. They are given a lot of authority and a lot, probably more authority than generally would be expected. So the thought that maybe he was on a business trip does not strike me as being even remotely outside the realm of the possibilities we have here. It's totally possible that he was out doing something else. He's on some trip that the king created for him. So that's a really sure. interesting. Even just elsewhere in point. the kingdom, he didn't even have to be out of oh, the country. Exactly. I mean, yeah. they didn't have cell phones it's and stuff. So if, if he had gone, if he had just gone somewhere else, he may, he may have not even had the foggiest idea what was going on. You're yeah. all very quiet tonight. It's a hard question. Something. It's because I told them it was on my intriguing questions list. They were like, oh dear. If it made the intriguing <laughs> questions list. I've always leaned towards that second answer, which was that Daniel was somehow exempt due to his interpretation of the dream. So what we saw is that there, um, they said these certain Chaldeans brought this concern. They called out a couple of men. I mean, it's reasonable to assume that those same people would have been the ones who were at risk for this horrible death due to their inability to interpret the dream. So were they like, all right, we're going to give Daniel Boy a pass because he took care of us, possibly. Robin says uh, the king knew Daniel's beliefs. Um, he hadn't hidden him out of sight as to sort of not create a stir with those demands. Like the king actively was like, hey, go over there. Like, I like you. We're going to do something dumb here. Um, Lori said maybe it was just their turn to show, show their love for God. So like God puts them in a very specific place so that... Um, so that they can really shine. That's that's an interesting perspective Just as well. That sovereignty of God. Yeah, yeah. I love all of those. No, what, what I, direction do you lean in? Well, yeah, I, I want to actually just, you don't have to turn there, but last week we, we read this verse in Daniel 2.10. It said, the Chaldeans, keyword Chaldeans, because th these are the men who just outed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as being not complying. The Chaldeans answered the king and says, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. Uh, no one can do this. And then they go on to say, no one's ever asked anything of a of, of wise man or a Chaldean. And I keep seeing the word Chaldean come up. So what yeah. I believe is that Daniel includes that here in chapter three to say, do you remember? Do you remember chapter two? When yeah, they go good. to round up Daniel, they were absolutely right. He wasn't the only one. They All of them. That means all the Chaldeans that were about to be dismembered. I mean, awful, awful way. They had to be absolutely terrified out of their minds. They were going to a certain yeah. death. And Daniel, we said last week, out of mercy, because he's a follower of God, he immediately says, stop, don't. Don't kill the wise men. Don't don't kill these people. I've got it. God is giving it to me. And he saves their lives. So it would yeah. stand to reason, even though they are still occultists and they're obviously not nice people and, and they obviously are not God fearing people, but it would stand to reason that if Daniel had literally saved them from being chopped into pieces and having their yeah. homes turned into dunghills, that they might have said to themselves, we hate we hate all of these, but man, we can't do it to Daniel. I mean, if it weren't for him, we'd be dead, you know. So we'll we'll like we'll sort of like give him a pass, but we're going after his buddies because it makes us mad that they took our job. So that's kind yeah. of what I think. That's that's a I think that's a very reasonable assumption. All fantastic answers. Let's look now at um let's look at 13 through 15. Let's see how Nebuchadnezzar chooses to respond to this moment, shall we? Um, then Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage 
commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the king image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Taunting, absolutely taunting. The king gives them an ultimatum. Yeah. You're about to hear the music. Are you ready to bow down? So spoiler alert, we'll get here in a moment. They're not going to, but it begs the question. We're going to just like be heavy on the questions tonight. It strikes me that they could have just been like, we're going to physically bow down, but in our hearts, we're going to worship our God. You know, yes, we'll, you know, we're going to fall to the ground when we hear it, but we're not going to assign any meaning to that. Um, our hearts and mind will still worship God. And, but if we do that, you know, we, we don't die. That, in my mind, that's a reasonable direction to take this to say, hey, um, okay, we can do that. You know, he can't, he can't force me to think this. He can force me to like physically posture my body in a certain mm -hmm. way, but he can't force me to mentally and with my heart worship his idol. Um, Nor he can, can he mind. read my mind? He doesn't yeah, know, he what, doesn't I'm know what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. I can fall down so, and worship my own God. It strikes so. me that that would be a reasonable response here. And I'm curious what you think, team. Why didn't they go that route? Why didn't they choose to, yeah, say God knows my heart and mind. God's not concerned with the, the external presentation as much. Like he knows my heart. As long as my heart's good, everything else is good. He's <laughs> understanding. He's loving. Yeah. He doesn't yeah, want me to die that? in an in a furnace, probably. Yes. Um, good. We thought. can help him out with this by just doing this, and we've taken care of it for God. We won't even need his help. <laughs> we, yeah, we're not going to be in hot water or yeah, hot fire. Actually. I like what Susie says. They're adamant about worshiping only the true God. They refuse to fake it. I love mm. that. Um, Sue says, like baptism, this would have been an outward and visible sign of their obedience to God. I, I like I like this because we tend to completely devalue any physical or external acts. Yeah. And Sue is drawing a comparison saying, hey, we actually do have external physical acts that have meaning. This would be similar in many ways. Um, the commandment says you shall not make an image and bow down to it. That is the commandment. Um, they would have compromised. It ultimately would have ruined their testimony at a later point. I love that. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Um, and Bob says, yes, well, it may be obvious to God. Those around them couldn't know their hearts. This gets back to that. Like they, they are there to be ambassadors and to be missionaries. If they do this, they've destroyed their ability to do that. So even beyond just the commandment, if we think really practically about their mission here, um, showing their obedience in the physical act of not bowing down. I love that. And Robin says, just obeying the commands that God has given. I love that. And then last one, James always coming in with just a beautiful bow on it. They were men in a position of authority. If they were yeah. to do so, then they would be leading others to worship a false God. That is so good. on. They, were, so they good. were the leaders. These are the ones who are holding the line on righteousness and um and obedience if they give in at this moment yeah they're they're leading everybody else down that path i yeah beautifully done as always so perfect commandment number one you shall have no other gods before me this is exodus 23 commandment number two you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or above this is exodus 20 so they know that we absolutely can't give on this. And what I love here is, you know, this, this really boils down just to obedience. There's huge courage involved in this. There's huge character involved in this. But when we act in obedience and we make it a, a decision to obey God, ultimately what we're saying is, God, I believe that you know what's best. You have, you have a better 
plan than what I'm going to come up with, even when it doesn't necessarily make sense. And that's what that's what we're doing. We see that in their response here. <laughs> it's um, yeah, it, it goes relatively poorly. Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. He will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And again, this goes really back to that, that obedience thing. Beyond any outcome that they're trying to get here, their sole focus is what have I been called to do in accordance with what God has told me to do. I Okay, so there's an aspect of this. Mom, we've talked about this a lot. I just want to sort of think out loud about it for a moment because there's a prevailing view in a lot of like mainstream Christianity today that we, um, our words are really powerful mm-hmm. and that we should be really careful with the words that we say, not in, you know, the sense of, you know, say, say edifying kind things, but rather that like, you don't want to speak things into existence. Like you want to be yep. very careful. And I, I was telling you, sorry, we've, we've had this. Um, I, I know people who uh, are, are believers who love the Lord. And if, if you say like, oh, you know, I'm feeling kind of sick. They're like, no, no, don't say that. Don't declare that. Don't like you. What you say is I'm, I'm being healed. I'm getting better. And the first couple of times I heard it, I was like, that's kind of weird. But like, OK, that sounds fine. Um, but it actually it comes from this interesting belief system where our words have like creative potential and creative power. If if any of you watching on Facebook or YouTube right now have either you sort of hold these thoughts or you've heard this before, give us a life, give us a, a heart so that we know this is resonating. I get a lot of this in Seattle. It's almost this like mystic Christianity mm-hmm. where um, we have almost like co-creative ability with God that God is very much looking to, oh, I'm getting all the hearts now. Yeah. Okay. God's okay, very good. much looking yeah. to, to my, my words and like what I'm declaring for, to activate whatever he's going to do. Yes. Like I yes, am yes, sort yes. of an impetus. The reason I bring this up is because when I read this verse and it's just, I'm going to put it up one more time because I think it's so critical when I read this and it says, be it known, um, we will not serve your images, um, anything that's going out of this. Um, this is this is interesting because well, these guys are talking about these guys are talking about this like even if he doesn't. Yeah, and which and is I, I wanna crazy. I, I wanna really kind of hone in on that because I think this is one of the absolute key verses in the entire book of Daniel. This is something that runs so counterculture to a lot of at least Western Christianity right now. In yeah. fact, I, I would like to ask the group, we, I, we told you we've got lots of questions for you tonight. So start weighing, weighing in here. Do you okay. think that their response indicated kind of a lack of faith or not? Yeah. And if you want to say even why. So, so when they said that, I mean, were they out of line should they have said something more along the lines of we know that God is able to deliver us and we know he will. We're declaring that God will deliver us out of your hand. O King. We are speaking that God will deliver us. Sue, I I put Sue's comment a moment ago. She said, this is a slightly mystic Christianity. And that's kind of how I describe it. And I don't mean to use that in a pejorative sense, but there is this aspect of it. That's uh, yeah. Kind of this co-creative, ability. If, if I were in the situation that they were in with some of these, again, these are good Christians. These people love the Lord. They're not doing anything. They're not trying to be crazy. But if I, I went in and I was like, even if God doesn't deliver us, I'll still serve them. They're like, why are you saying that? Why are you even declaring mm-hmm. that that's an option? I'd be like, whoa. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, it is though. Right. And I, I just love this. Robin just says, oh, I guess it's not showing. There it is. They're an acceptance of whatever God's decision was, that sovereignty of God. They're accepting God's will. There's not a lack of faith at all. Agreed. I like this. I like this. Um, at the time, this is Dottie, they didn't know God's plan. That is huge. Let's, 
yeah, let's just hold this in our head for a moment because I want to come back to that. I just love this. They're basing it on God's will. Yes, Susie, a hundred percent. This is a <laughs> Robin coming in with the scripture. My plans are not your plans. My ways are not your ways. I don't think that was even written at this point. If I, well, maybe, no, I guess it was. Um, they're not presuming on God. Yes, Alan. So agree a hundred percent, 10,000 percent. I'm so Their glad response. to see your comments there. You guys are so, so good. And I also love yeah. the immediate identification that that line of thinking is really kind of this mystic Christianity. It's it's risky. Yeah. Mom, talk to us. I want to dive into this. Why is this risky thinking? Why would we say, who <laughs> that's, you know, that kind of speak it into existence. Our words activate God's will. Mm-hmm. Our words activate our gifts. Why is that well, a little risky? You know, something that I think I'm always kind of just aware of in my own life and in the things I'm listening to, the things I'm reading, the the, the sermons I'm hearing is, is this God centric or is this me centric? Because if you want just like a, a really easy, quick dichotomy to go, is this good or is this bad? Is this of God or is this of the devil? Um, anytime that it is God, 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 Jesus centric, Holy Spirit centric, I mean, really it's all focused on God and who he is and his power and his sovereignty. You can get on board with that 100%. Yeah. When it becomes about me, red mm. flags and sirens should be going off in your mind all over the place. And so when we when we read something like this and people, I, I've never heard preachers who preach this ever discuss this passage. I just don't think that they really can do it because it would undermine everything that they want to, to preach about your faith being so... Um, powerful and it activates what God wants to do already without your faith God wants to act but you know I've heard them say he but he can't because like your faith is the key that unlocks the door Uh, of God's power what okay so that is all me 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 if this is all dependent on me then that's again sirens should be going off wait a minute I have nothing to do with it these boys sit down and go we're helpless we can't, we can't do it. Although I think it is very interesting. And I want to, I want to say this real quickly. Um, what is it? Verse 17, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. So there's the faith. We know he yep. can do it from the burning fiery verses, but, but listen to what they say next. And he will deliver us out of your hand. O King. Okay. Now listen, yeah. they did say he will, and then they follow it up with, but even if he doesn't, we won't serve your God or bow down to you. So what they're saying is one way or another King, God will deliver us from you. Noel, what, what are our options there? Uh, so I think the most likely option, and this is maybe probably even what they assumed is that they were going to go to that furnace and they were going to die for their God. That's right. And that would be delivering them out of the hand. Yeah, because they're they're looking at this from an an eternal an eternal point of view, from a kingdom point of view. So they're looking at it going, no matter what happens here, God is going to deliver us out of your hand. You do not you think you're, you know, this golden statue dude. You don't get the final yes. say here. Our God does. Yes. And I I just oh, I, I love this so much because In many ways, I think this takes so much pressure off of us. I mean, if these guys, you know, let's just for for sake of argument, say that 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 line of doctrine, that thinking, that sort of what might be called word of faith, um, and and that's a much broader term, but I'm going to use it here. Let's say that's correct. That puts such huge pressure on them right now. They need to muster up enough faith because they are. That's right. It, they're holding their lives in their hands. Like if they don't get this right, if they don't have enough faith, if they don't speak it right or speak the right thing, or, you know, if they're not, yep. they're dead. And exactly. And it's all their this, fault. Exactly. It's all yeah. their fault. I love this. Free from physical fire, still alive, or they're taken to heaven. These are the only two options. Oh, and okay. this is so no, can I hop in there for, for just a second? It, because I, again, I, I think this is so applicable to our lives in so many ways. So, so here it is, 2021. I know from our Facebook page with our Thursday prayer focus that we have a lot of needs in this group and so often interceding for other people who are really, really sick. And, and you might have that going on currently with a friend or a family member or maybe even with yourself. And I think the thought is so often, if I just have enough faith, then God will heal 
me, my family member, my friend. And if he doesn't heal them, as Noel was just saying, then there's something my wrong fault. with me. It must be my fault because he's got the power. I just activate it with the faith. What this would tell us is that it is perfectly, perfectly good and righteous to say to God, I believe you can heal me. But yeah. even if you don't, I get healed when I go to heaven. I believe you can heal my mom, my grandma, my son, my daughter, my friend, my uncle, my coworker. I believe you can. But even if you don't, you are still good. You are still true. You are still righteous. And you are still worthy of my worship. My friends, that takes way more faith than just going, yeah. oh, I have enough faith to, to activate God like he's my genie, you know, rub it the right way and he, he activates. Well, and again, I think especially in our day and age, you know, once in a while we get to see this just a miraculous, incredible healing from God. Oftentimes we don't. Mm -hmm. And what's really, I think, um, dangerous about this line of thinking is when we don't see that, um, when we don't see healing, I've actually heard people say, and, and they think they're saying something right. They'll say, well, the reason, the reason your mother died is because you didn't have enough faith. And I'm like, oh my gosh, who, what a horrific, horrific thing to say. Yeah. Absolutely not. It, it so takes out, it's almost like you messed up the will of God because you couldn't muster enough faith or you didn't say the right thing. Or, you know, you at one point, you know, indicated verbally that maybe God wasn't going to heal and that's what like jinxed it. It's, oh my goodness, no, no, no. I cannot, I cannot say it strongly enough. God mm -hmm. loves you and has a plan for you and it's a beautiful plan. And, and your faith is powerful, but not in like manipulating the world or getting God to do something. Like we're still under his sovereign hand. And I don't know, that brings me so much comfort. I hope it brings some of you comfort of you're not you're not in charge you're not like under responsibility of saying the right thing in order to get a result like we don't it doesn't have ride that on you power yeah and that gives i don't know that gives me so 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 much comfort of god is sovereign god's plan is still going to happen however he wants it to and and i get to be part of that and he might use me um to do something and i hope he does i'm going to pray for that i'm going to be watching for that but I'm not responsible here for, you know, life or death from, you know, whether or not my faith was strong enough. That's not absolutely in my prerogative. And I love that. Here's the other thing. When these folks talk about sort of this co-creative ability with God, what's, fun, what's sort of funny to me, we'll get to this in a moment. I always, I always think if God was, if God was uh, wholly contingent on what I could speak, and my ability to ask for the right thing, like I would, the life I have right now, I wouldn't have because I'd never be audacious enough. I'm not even creative enough to ask for that. And I think that's true here too. I cannot imagine that these three young men ever would have had the creative prowess to ask for what God is about to do. They wouldn't have had the audacity to do such a thing because God just thinks so much bigger and so much cooler than the rest of us. And I love that. Um, I just, I want to finish this and then we'll go on to the next one. God has a plan for each one of us. Therefore, we can't activate God's power. We can live by faith. And then as a result of that, we have enormous peace. It's such mm. a beautiful way to end this. We're not, we're not manipulating the world. We're not in charge. We're not the power brokers. God no. is sovereign and we get to be part of his sovereign plan. And that's what these guys are saying. Amen. Regardless of what you do, Nebuchadnezzar, God is going to deliver us, whether he delivers us by taking us to heaven or if he delivers us by something else that frankly, we can't even imagine. God's going to deliver us. So you King Nebuchadnezzar, like you're win -win. Doing really big stuff right now. You're not. God's going to win this one. And I love that. And, so and, re great. and, and regardless of what God chooses to do, he is still worthy of our worship and we will not bow down no matter what. And I love yeah. that too. That yeah. I, I just know that just has to move the heart of God. When things are going along really, really great, I mean, praise God for those blessed moments that we have in our lives and, and sometimes even more than just we a moment that. where he's yeah. just blessed. But, but those are the times when it's easy to praise him and worship him and follow him. Yeah. When things are absolutely blowing up like nobody's business, and you go, I don't care 
I will still choose to worship him. I will still choose yeah, to obey hard. him. Um, I, I just know that has to just absolutely touch the heart of God. And that's what these boys absolutely. do. So should, should we go on to verses 19 to 23, Noel? Let's do it. Yeah, you, you can read this on the screen. I want to touch on a couple pieces of this. He orders some of the mighty men of his army to bind them and then to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Just hold it. We bolded this. This isn't in the text. Some of the mighty men of his army. Note that these are not, these are his, you know, Navy seals that he sent in for this. These men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments. They were thrown into the fiery furnace. Um, okay. <laughs> so if you've ever accidentally lit something on fire, like a small piece of fabric, you know, that is even going to just light. I mean, so he binds them with their cloaks, their tunics and their hats and their, all their garments. Like they're, they're inflammable material. This isn't like our nice cotton either. I mean, this is super flammable stuff. And this is just crazy. The King's order is so urgent. The furnace overheated and then the flame of the fire killed those mighty men we were just talking about who took up Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. So they, <laughs> He's overheated this furnace. He's so enraged. He's so furious. They're not even they're not even there yet. And it's killed the the Navy SEALs who got sent in to pop them in there. And yet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are still alive. And they fall into this furnace. They're still bound in all their clothes and tied up. And they fall in. What happens next? So King Nebuchadnezzar is watching this from a safe distance. And he, this is crazy. He was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? Like everybody do a count check real quick. They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire. They are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Ooh. Oh, All so right, we go group. back to, you know, God just does far and away beyond anything we can ask for. I can guarantee you these guys never thought to themselves, you know, we should very specifically pray that like this is wild. Mm -hmm. What's our that question? The fire for the group? I want to ask the group, who do you think the fourth one is in that fire? So sound off on that. By the way, I'm going to tell you up front, little spoiler alert, the Bible doesn't tell us specifically. So this is merely a what do you think sort of question. We're open to whatever you happen to think here. But Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, I try to always picture the scene in my mind. Can you imagine the look on his face when suddenly he's like, wait, one, two, three, four. No, that can't be right. One, two, three, four. Hey, guys. <laughs> he's like, did we throw in three? He's like, maybe I'm losing my mind. Yeah. yeah. There's four. And that fourth one doesn't look like the other ones. Looks like a son of the gods. Remember, he's still totally polytheistic here. Oh, 100%. so he yeah. believes that this is some sort of manifestation of, of little God, G yeah. God. So let's see, <sighs> Noel, what are people saying here? Oh, we've got Jesus. Like that came in seconds. I love that. And then <laughs> somebody responds and says, or it's one of God's angels. Okay. And somebody else says, a guardian angel. I, I love this. Um, I like to think Jesus. Because he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Robin says, Gabriel. Um, and so, so this is interesting. It says either an angel or a Christophany. I love the Gabriel. word Christophany. James always coming in with a big word. Mom, what is a Christophany? Well, you know that Jesus, as a member of the triune God, is eternal always existed, always will exist. So prior to his incarnation, big word that just means when he became a human being in like in human form here on this earth, he was still fully God, also fully human. Before that time in Bethlehem, he still existed. And from time to time in the Old Testament, he shows up yeah. <laughs> and in a pre-incarnate form. And so a Christophany is just simply that there are no Christophanies after the conception of Jesus, because right. he was named, we know his name now, it's Jesus, we know who he is, he's, he's uh, got a body. But prior to that, any time that you read, like Genesis 16, if you want to go read it at some point, um, there's this Christophany that God shows up to Hagar, who was Abraham's servant woman, who has Ishmael, and he, and he talks with her. And she 
addresses him as God. And she says, I can't believe I'm still alive. I, I Who can talk to God, who can see God and live? And yet I just did. Um, and so that's that's just one example. So um, I think it was James that said that. So he's saying maybe yeah. it was a pre-incarnate version of Jesus that was present in the fire. Um, and then others of you saying maybe it was an angel, maybe it was a guardian angel. Noelle, do you have any thoughts on that? You know, I think all of these are likely answers. From a narrative perspective, it actually makes sense to me that this is a Christophany. That is, that this is a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ who's with them. Um, but in some ways, the the precise answer to this, it could be an angel. It could be Jesus Christ. It could be Gabriel. I love that we got a really specific angel. Um, what's so critical about it, and I think it's the part that that I've often even sort of missed in this story is it's really easy to just really focus on, you know, there, you know, Jesus is always with you and he'll be in the fire with you. And it's like, that is so absolutely true. A hundred percent. I think for me, what's more impactful though, is when I zoom out a little bit and go, this is the result of obedience is that sometimes obedience still sends you to the fire. Mm. (laughs) And these, they, they were so obedient. They were so consistent. And they were, they were just faithful. They're like, God is sovereign. Whatever he does, he is still God. We're still going to worship him. Eyes are still on him. And in this instance, God saves them in an extraordinary way. And I love that he comforts them in that moment. And he's actually physically present with them so that Nebuchadnezzar looks in and is like, oh, that's not normal. That's not reasonable behavior going on in there. Um, their obedience is really the core piece of this though. And I think for myself, what does that, you know, what does that obedience look like for me? Absolutely. When I walk into that in obedience, I know that Christ is with me right next to me and present with me. So there, but it still takes immense courage to walk into that knowing full well that this could go badly in a, Mm human sense, you know, badly from my perspective of how I want my life to go or badly from how I've planned for my um, future to go down. And it's that obedience piece of it that, again, I, I I love this story. One of my favorite, favorite, favorite worship songs is called Another in the Fire. And it's referencing this, that there's another in the fire with us. But ultimately, the, the, precipitating event that got them here was actually their obedience. And Mm -hmm. I think that's really the, one of the major themes of this book is just what does obedience look like in the absolute worst possible scenario and under the worst possible conditions known to man. We've said this before. I I hope so much that none of you have had an experience where you're like, Oh yeah, I've, I've been obedient to the point that it, uh, you know, led me into the jaws of a horrific, violent, awful death. Like, I hope so much that that's not anyone's scenario. But I, I wonder even for myself, like, how would I do in that? Well, how would I do in the small things that God asks me to be obedient in every day that absolutely do not lead to death, but are still hard that I still struggle with? Oh, my goodness, if, if I'm being called to be obedient in that, how much more so am I called to be obedient in the very small things that he's asked me to do as a believer? And the ways that he's asked me to be a a witness. One of the things that was said earlier that I just, oh, I just love is that beyond even just they need to follow the law. And so that's why these young men were like, we cannot bow down. That is against the law. Let's take it even a step further. If they had and been like, oh, in my heart, you know, God knows my heart. They lose their ability almost entirely to lead other people to obedience. So their obedience is a a leadership trait. It is a a pinnacle of um, how they're going to affect the culture and affect change among their own people. And I think for myself, how many times has it been like, oh, I can go to that thing. I can do that thing. I know my heart. This doesn't this doesn't lead to legalism. This leads to how can I be upholding the highest level of obedience to God, and not trying to create little like loopholes and workarounds. So that my obedience is easier, but rather, how can I leverage my obedience to be a leader and to be um, to be um, just an effective witness for Christ? What does that look like day to day? 
close and, us out. What are your thoughts on that, mom? Well, I'm just thinking, you know, the first step of obedience for anybody is is to repent of our sins to begin yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you we can come up with like, oh, it, wouldn't it be great to just be like fully obedient? But how are you going to do that if you don't even possess the Holy Spirit because you sure. don't even know Jesus? I mean, how frustrating would that be to try to do? So what what we want to we don't know who's watching always and and we don't know what your background is and and if you if you know Jesus as your savior you don't know him as your savior uh, but here's what we want you to do what is that next step of obedience for you maybe it is going you know what God's been working on my heart for a while and I I honestly don't I don't get it yet I I feel like there's tons I don't know okay then that next step of obedience is to pursue that to open up that Bible and start reading it, to to listen to Bible Study Hub, go back and listen to ones that you've missed. Get the word of God into your mind. That would be the first step. Some of you are like, I know it. And I just have never, I don't know, I've never been able to just bring myself to that point of total humility going, I am a destitute sinner in need of a savior. And I know I can't save myself. You need to cry out to him for salvation. That would be your next step. For some of you, you've done that. You've never been baptized. You need to be baptized. That is a public declaration of what God said in your heart. And then some of you are just like, I don't know. I've just got like stuff I know I'm supposed to be doing for the Lord and I'm not really doing it. And okay, good. Identify what that is and, and pursue it and pray that God will help you do it. So I think all of us, 100% of us have that next step of obedience. It's just going to look a little bit different depending on who you are and where you are. But we want to encourage you like we're in that we're in that path with you somewhere along the path and we're all just taking that next step of obedience. Let's just, let's like link arms together and encourage each other to do that. That's awesome. That's awesome way to end. Um, we hit on a lot of great stuff tonight. I want to briefly circle back to um, this, what, what we're sort of calling mystic Christianity or word of faith Christianity. Um, some of you very likely were listening to that and going, I do that. Like I, it's not, it's not me trying to be self-centered or it's not, you know, trying to affect change in the world or try to force God into something. And I totally hear you on that. I, I want you to know that it's, you know, we sort of use those phrases. They weren't pejorative in any way, but if I can just encourage you to really dive into what are the underpinnings of that belief system? What are the underpinnings of that behavior and that action and that, um, the, the words that we're saying and why we believe it. Uh, I, I'm seeing a lot, at least in my world right now in Seattle, a lot of this movement towards a more um, a more mystic, like supernatural, almost new age, new thought Christianity. And it's really concerning to me, actually, because I see it. It's so insidious. It's so it's so simple to get that in there. And it's like, you know, it just starts with, oh, don't say that you're sick. Declare that God's already healed you. It's like, well, I don't know why that would be a problem. That seems totally fine. And if we walk that all the way down, we start getting these places where it's like, ooh, it's a little bit risky. So I, we touched on that a little bit. I want to encourage you, if, if that's something that maybe you're bought into or you've been you know, playing around with or hearing a little bit of, definitely dive into that. It's something that I've been doing a really deep dive in my study over the past three or four weeks. You've probably heard a lot of it coming out in this study because of it. Whatever I'm studying just ends up coming out here. It's such a problem. That would be a great, <laughs> that would be a great thing to go a little bit deeper on. And this is a great passage to jump off of that from. So just an encouragement on what maybe some external study looks like outside of this. As always, we're so, so grateful to have each one of you here. We love you and appreciate you. Um, and we want you to know that you're always welcome on the Bible Study Hub Facebook page. We have Thursday prayers. Um, and we just, you know, pray for each other and intercede for each other. We do this every Monday night live. You can watch it back on YouTube, share it with your friends, send it to people. We want this to be a resource for you that is super, super valuable. So you can also give feedback to us on what we can do to make it better. So thank you for joining us. Go out there and make good decisions team. And we'll see you next week. Bye.